All right, this morning our text is in Acts 16. I've already told you it's about the demon-possessed girl that follows uh, Paul and Silas and the company around, uh, basically seemingly helping them, but was actually, we have to see, attacking. Uh, obviously from Paul's response, uh, we, we know that that's certainly the case. But uh, let's begin by reading um, Acts 16, verses 16 through 24. It happened that as we were going to the place of prayer, a slave girl having a spirit of divination met us, who was bringing her masters much profit by fortune-telling. Following after Paul and us, she kept crying out, saying, These men are bondservants of the Most High God, who are proclaiming to you the way of salvation. She continued doing this for many days, but Paul was greatly annoyed. And turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out at that very moment. But when her master saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the authorities. And when they had brought them to the chief magistrates, they said, These men are throwing our city into confusion, being Jews, and are proclaiming customs which it is not lawful for us to accept or to observe, being Romans. The crowd rose up together against them, and the chief magistrates tore their robes off them and proceeded to order them to be beaten with rods. When they had struck them with many blows, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to guard them securely, and he, having received such a command, threw them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. Now, that's, that's all we're going to look at today because the, the next section, of course, is rather lengthy and, and involved. Plus, this one deals with, I think, primarily uh, the topic we're looking at this morning, which is spiritual warfare. Now, last week, we saw Paul and his companions in Philippi uh, seeking to go to the Jew first on the Sabbath. That's the way, of course, the apostles worked. Uh, God had made his covenant with Abraham, and of course, it was Abraham's children that first needed to hear the gospel, and so they took that very seriously. Now, not finding any synagogue in the city, they went looking in the next most likely place to find Jews a place of prayer next to the river. And remember, it was next to the river so the Jews could follow through with their ceremonial purification rites. What they found were some God-fearing women, which means they were Gentile women who had been converted to Judaism but were not full converts, who had gathered for worship. They sat down to teach them, and while Paul was ministering, the Lord opened Lydia's heart. And she believed. Last week we really focused on the fact that unless the Lord changes the heart, unless the Spirit of God gives the new birth, no one will believe. Now we, we need to understand that so that we might give Him the praise that is His due, but also so that we may understand what, you know, who it is we need to look to for the conversion of those that we seek to minister to. Now apparently she was not the only one who was converted. The Lord also had mercy on her servants. And, we, you know, it appears as though she brought these servants with her to worship God on his holy day. That's what the faithful head of a household would, would do. Um, gather their, the household together to honor and to worship the Lord as he commands on his Sabbath. Now, after she and her house were baptized, remember, she immediately began to support the work by inviting Paul and the others into her home and uh, showing that she was, in fact, changed. I mean, when you were, you were dead, you lived one way. Uh, when the Lord brought you to life, you, you lived another way. And that difference, of course, is how you can tell that you're no longer dead. And we see that immediately in Lydia, that she wants to support the work of God by supporting these servants, by bringing them into her house. But again, we're reminded this morning from our passage that as the kingdom of God begins to exert itself, begins to move forward, saving individuals, the kingdom of darkness begins to resist. As they were going to this place of prayer on a subsequent Sabbath to continue to teach the new converts and to evangelize people that had been invited to come, 
a demon-possessed girl met them and began to interfere with their work. Now again, this morning Luke reminds us that we're involved in a spiritual war. Satan is going to work to stop us from doing what it is that God calls us to do. And that's something we always need to bear in mind as we're exhorted in Scripture to be on the watch you know, prayerfully for the enemy so that when he comes we might resist and repel him. Now, first of all, we see the devil sometimes attacks more directly. Uh, I think perhaps he uses methodologies like this even today, even though, well, you know, there may not... Um, well, actually, I think there is still demon possession. That's something that's questioned within uh, Reformed denominations, but we don't see a lot of it. But he works in more subtle ways. Now, the first thing we want to look at is who this girl was. Luke tells us that she was a slave, which means that there were those who owned her and those who were profiting from her ability. He tells us, secondly, that this ability came from a spirit of divination. Okay. The word that Luke uses here for this spirit is a, a Greek word which is pronounced puthon, which is where we get our English word python. You see the similarity between the words, python. What, well, what's a python? It's a snake, right? But the significance of it is brought out by A.T. Robertson when he writes this in his uh, word pictures of the New Testament. Python was the name given to the serpent that kept guard at Delphi, slain by Apollo. Okay. Plutarch, uh, who I believe was a, uh, I want to say a Jewish philosopher who lived from A.D. 50 to 100, says that the term was applied to ventriloquists. In the Septuagint, those with familiar spirits are called by the word ventriloquist, including the witch of Endor. It is possible that this slave girl had this gift of prophecy by Susain. Now, I'm not sure if ventriloquist meant something different to them than it does to us. We think of ventriloquist as somebody who throws their voice and makes something else or, or a dummy or something like that speak. But in this case, the servant girl had a gift of Susain fortune-telling, predicting the future. This was how she was making money for her masters. Uh, when somebody was robbed, they would uh, ask her to locate the thief. When they lost something valuable, they would ask her to find it. Uh, they would come to her to find out if an investment was good. Boy, we could use some of those today, right? <laughs> no, we can't. But of course, they always came with payment, didn't they? Because it costs for her service. Now, the question we need to ask is, was she really able to do these things? I mean, could she really predict the future and tell whether maybe an investment was good or what's going to happen in a particular struggle between two world powers? Well, no. Only God can tell the future. But we do know the devil can predict something, and then he can go out and make certain things come to pass. So in a certain sense, he can do that. He can find things that are lost. He can also motivate somebody to steal something and then reveal his whereabouts. He can make people sick and then seemingly heal them by no longer making them sick. The Bible calls these false signs and lying wonders, and apparently he did it enough with this particular girl to give her the reputation of being someone who was able to accomplish these things. Now, when she saw Paul and his companions... She began shouting out as she was following them, These men are bondservants of the Most High God who are proclaiming to you the way of salvation. Seems like um, free advertisement from the enemy. It almost looks like she's trying to help them. But is that what she was really trying to do? Now we know that that, that can't be the case. Remember what happened when Jesus was accused of casting out demons by the power of the Prince of Demons? He argued that if Satan was casting out Satan, if his kingdom was divided against itself, it couldn't stand. Now, if this demon-possessed girl was really trying to help them, the same thing would be true of her. She would be, she, well, basically would represent Satan's kingdom being divided. He would be fighting against himself. Well, since that can't be the case, what was really going on here? Well, there's been several suggestions. It's possible that, that, like Legion, the Spirit of God was forcing her to speak the truth against her will. 
But we don't, I don't think we should think that is likely the case because in a few days Paul's going to turn to her and he's going to cast the demon out because he's annoyed with what she's doing. So maybe not. It's possible the demon was being deceptive, trying to identify with these men because they saw or the demon saw that uh, they were becoming more and more popular as people were gathering around them, perhaps siding with them so that these people might be encouraged to come to her. We know that sometimes the devil appears as an angel of light trying to deceive us. You know, that's what he did during the Great Awakening. Jonathan Edwards takes note of the fact that the Spirit of God wouldn't have done these things, but he says the way the devil works is he sees what God is doing, and then he tries to stop it. You know, he tries to stop it by maybe discrediting those who are evangelizing or uh, trying to tempt people to, to get away from those things that he's doing. But then Edward says if he can't stop the devil, or if the devil can't stop the work of God, then he begins to push it forward into extremes. And certainly that happened in those days. People began doing some pretty weird things. But he also does that today. Just watch Christian television and see if the devil isn't pushing people who profess Christianity into some pretty extreme things. Now, it's also possible that she did this to distract them, to basically get in their way. I mean, having a, a known fortune teller following you around, acting like she's part of your group, isn't actually going to help you evangelize. And we shouldn't also discount the fact that she may have been saying this in a very mocking kind of way. You know, one, one interpretation I think is, is pretty interesting because maybe it doesn't, wouldn't occur to us right away. But another thing to consider is how the people that she was speaking to would have understood what she was saying because we're assuming they would understand it the way we understand it. Now, to the Jew and to us, the title Most High God would mean Yahweh, the Lord of the universe. But to the Greeks, and virtually everybody there was Greek, it would mean Zeus. What they may have heard was this. These men are servants of Zeus, the Most High God, who are showing you, by the way, the translation I read is really inaccurate. It's not the way of salvation, but a way of salvation. And she may very well have been saying, these men are servants of Zeus who have come to show you a way to appease the gods. In other words, she was misleading the people with regard to what they were doing. That seems fairly likely to me. But whatever the reason, after she had done this, as I've said already for several days, Paul finally had enough. And he turned and commanded the Spirit to come out of her in the name of Jesus Christ. And as it must, because of Paul's relationship with Christ and the power that he gave him, it immediately obeyed and left her. Okay, so attack strategy one by the enemy fails. But the devil knows more than one way to fight, doesn't he? The next thing he does is he uses the greedy and vindictive nature of, her, of basically her masters in order to attack. The change in the woman must have been immediate. It must have been obvious. Oftentimes when the Lord would deliver someone, what's the first thing that they would do? They would begin praising God for his mercy. Now Luke doesn't tell us she did that, but there was some obvious way that you could tell she wasn't the same person. When her master saw that her ability to make money for them was gone, they dragged Paul and Sar uh, Silas before the authorities. Notice that Timothy and Luke were not taken and they were not put into the prison, probably because their role in the exorcism was not so obvious as Paul and Silas. When they arrived, these men accused them. And notice, too, what they accused them of. Not of casting out a demon and ruining their business, isn't that what they were upset about? The magistrate might not have objected to that. He might have thought that was a good thing. But of proclaiming customs that were not lawful for Romans to observe. Notice the devil attacked where he was most likely to succeed because what they were doing was actually against the law. The Romans allowed the Jews to practice their own religion. Remember, it was a legal religion because the Jews would rather die than give it up. The Romans would have to exterminate them in order to stop it. So instead, they gave them the right to worship. But 
they were not allowed to proselytize. By the way, that tenacity with which the Jews held to their religion is the same tenacity that we ought to have with regard to our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So the Jews could have it, but they could not share it. They could not proselytize. Rome did not yet understand that Christianity was really a different religion. If they had, they would have arrested them on other grounds. But in their view, they were still breaking the law. And that's, again, what Satan essentially uh, in, inspired, so to speak, these masters of accusing them with, and that accusation stuck. Notice the crowd grabbed them, the magistrates tore off their robes, ordered them to be beaten. I think this is kind of interesting, isn't it? All this was done without a trial. Apparently, all that was necessary to convict a non-Roman citizen, at least from their perspective that they are non-Romans, was an accusation by a few witnesses, not even any kind of a trial. When Paul and Silas later tell the jailer they're both Roman citizens and were punished without a trial, the magistrates will become very concerned. But you see, that privilege only applied to Roman citizens. Perhaps they didn't raise this objection because they didn't have time. They got you know, hauled off too quickly. Everything went too fast. Or it may have been that they sensed that the Lord had a plan in this to glorify himself in some way which they would later discover. And as a matter of fact, we're going to see next time, he did have a plan to save the jailer and his whole household. So after they were beaten, they were thrown into the inner prison. And I think an interesting point here is that public prisons that the Romans built had a foyer, what's called a vestibule or entrance. They had outer cells, probably for the lesser crimes. And then they had an inner cell for the more severe crimes that was basically a dungeon, a dark dungeon with no windows and no air circulation, so reserved for the worst offenders, and their imprisonment was made even more uncomfortable for them by having their feet fastened in the stocks where they could not move. So as far as the devil's concerned, nothing is too harsh to inflict on those who herald the good news of the gospel by which God sets free. His, his victims. Now this is where they're going to remain until midnight when the Lord will set them free in order that the jailer might also be free. Now let's conclude, I want to stop the narrative here, but I want to conclude by just considering uh, four things from what we've just looked at. First of all, again, let's consider how the enemy works against us to keep us from doing something in particular. Because what is it that Paul and Silas were doing? They were evangelizing. Where is it that the enemy is going to attack us the most? He, he's going to attack us at that point, but also in every step in between, between us and the individual that we should be sharing the gospel with, he's going to try to stop us at every step. I think beginning at keeping us away from the things that will make us stronger. But let's, let's consider some of the things we see from this text. Sometimes the devil appears as an angel of light, somebody who appears to side with God, but who's actually working to undermine what, what the Lord is, is doing. Now, I think that's one of the reasons why we have so many variations of so-called Christian variations, you might say, of Christianity that, that are just popping up everywhere. Not the least of which, of course, the health and wealth movement, which I've spoken of on numerous occasions, abundant life, abundant living, victorious living. Um, because these people claim to be Christians, they, they quote from the Bible, they try to use the Bible to, to teach what, what it is they're teaching. I mean, I was in one of those churches for years. And these leaders may actually believe what they're saying is true. Somehow they miss everything else the Bible says. And they just focus in on anybody who happened to be wealthy and any promise that God gives of giving us money. Okay, that's what they focus on, that and, and health. Uh, well, what's behind that? If you're in one of those churches, that's all you talk about. That's all you do. You just try to get healed and you try to make money. That is not what the kingdom of heaven is all about. That comes from the devil. He's the one who is bringing that about. Or what about the anti-lordship movement? 
what we call antinomianism or the easy believism movement, which basically says just believe the facts of the Bible, pray the sinner's prayer, and you're on your way to heaven, and you don't have to serve the Lord. You don't have to obey Him. You don't have to repent of your sins. You can go to heaven just on the basis of saying that prayer. Or what about liberal churches, you know, that mix in what looks like Christianity with, with belief system that is completely anti-supernatural? What about the many cults? Okay, well, we know that Satan is working overtime. He appears as an angel of light. Did, did Joseph Smith actually see an angel by the name of Moroni? If he did, who was that angel? Okay. There's a lot of people that are wrapped up in the Mormon religion, and the Mormon religion is not Christianity. It's as far away from Christianity as you can possibly get, and yet he has them all convinced that they're actually the ones who are going to benefit from the God who exists, who in their view is just one of perhaps an infinite number of gods. The devil knows that if he can get us to believe his lies that he will effectively neutralize us as any kind of threat towards him. Anything that he can, get, can, can convince us to believe that's going to keep us from engaging the war is basically a, a, you know, a, a victory on his part. So we have to be careful of those things. That's one of the ways in which he works. He can also work to distract us, to get our eyes off of what we're supposed to be doing and to put them on things that are either secondary, and, and I think under this, you know, there was a movement, it still exists, I think, within even reform circles, uh, that's called Christian Reconstructionism. And some of the views of this are basically, let's get into government and let's try to impose God's will from the top down. Well, I, there's nothing wrong with getting into politics and trying to work towards reform and trying to get things to work the right way, but... But that isn't really what the Lord calls us to do. What we need to do is work from the bottom up. We need to do the work of the kingdom of heaven in evangelizing uh, in order for people's hearts to change so that they would desire such, you know, such laws or, or such leaders. So we can get sidetracked from perhaps the most important things, or he may distract us and get us involved in things that we might say are just downright frivolous such as getting us to devote our lives to things that in the end essentially are a waste of precious time. Uh, the pursuit of, of celebrity status, uh, seeking after men's praise. I mean, a lot of so-called professing Christians are doing that instead of what the Lord calls them to do. You know, if you, if you do what the Lord calls you to do, this is a rhetorical question, what is the world going to think of you? Are they going to love you? Or are they going to hate you? Well, how can you be a celebrity and be a faithful Christian at the same time? You see, you have to compromise. And, and that's one of the things that the devil does. And we, you know, what, another thing that we need to guard ourselves against as Reformed Christians, I think, is this, and I have been very guilty of this myself, is the endless pursuit of knowledge for knowledge's sake. Somehow thinking that the best Christian is the one who is the most informed Christian. You know, the more that I know, the more glorifying to God I am. But you know, that isn't true because the more I know and the more I don't do, the more I become culpable for. The best Christian, the one who is greatest in the kingdom of heaven, is the one who not only knows what God's will is, but who actually humbles himself to do what the Lord commands him to do, right? It's, that's what the Lord's going to examine on that day is not, here's a theology test, see how you score. But this is your life. What did you do with what I gave you? And what have you produced? You know, that, that's what he's going to be looking at. And we need to remember that. But the devil gets our eyes off of that. And all we think about all day long, it seems like in reform circles, we're always fighting over doctrinal issues. And some of those are important. We do need to fight over them. But we can't let all of our time get absorbed in that. We need to be about the work that the Lord calls us to do. Of course, Satan is also working hard at getting others to misunderstand what we and Christianity are all about, right? He is the accuser of the brethren. He is the one who slanders us. 
And I, you know, just listen to uh, some of the prominent atheists and what they think of what God says in His Word about the role of women. They think that we're deprecating somehow their worth or that we're being unjustly harsh against homosexuals or the gender confused. The devil is going to expose every issue the Bible teaches that is going to make us the most hated in this world. So he's working to undermine Christianity. He's working to thwart us, to distract us. He's, he's working to get us off track, to, to lead us astray. He's working to neutralize us. Again, as what this spirit-possessed woman might have been trying to do in her attempts to attack Paul and Silas. Now, he will also attack us, of course, personally, particularly in the areas where we fail the most, trying to convince us that God could never forgive us or that we could not really truly be Christians if we would do anything like that. He is, as I've said before, the accuser, the slanderer, and he will take every opportunity. Uh, Edward said something else that was quite interesting, and that is, while we're young, the devil will try to do everything he can to convince us we have plenty of time ahead of us, and we don't have to take Christianity seriously now. We should just kind of have fun, take it seriously later, and then when it, we get later in our life and it's time to take it seriously, he says, oh, why bother now? You've already wasted your life. Just let the rest of it go. God's not going to accept you now. Just remember, he's always working against you. There's always one right thing to do, and that is to follow the Lord, to serve Him, to seek to bring Him glory. Now, the second thing I want us to consider is knowing that this is how He works, we need to think about, and I think we already have, I'm sure, whether or not He succeeded. Has He succeeded in these areas against us? Have we believed His lies? Has He distracted us from what's most important? Are we now afraid to identify publicly as Christians because of the stigma that he's attached to Christianity? Has he convinced us that knowing the right thing to do is enough? We don't actually have to do it. Has he convinced us that we couldn't possibly be Christians? Has he really made us ineffective in sharing the gospel? You know, how, how well has he done against us in particular? Now, thirdly, what can we do about it? Okay. How can we recover? How can we get back on the right track? Well, we need to get back into the Word. You know, the Word is, is primary. It's, it's fundamental. We need to remind ourselves what the truth is. Okay. I think, first of all, again, the helmet of salvation, I think, is the, the assurance that we belong to the Lord. We need to remember that if we belong to the Lord, that we will never be lost. And if we know that we are trusting in Jesus because we love Him, we love God, we love His ways, and we hate the fact that we've fallen into sin, then we can know that we belong to Him, and He's never going to let go of us. We need to be reminded of what the goal of the Christian life is. It's not to be the world's hero, the celebrity, but it's to be the Lord's hero. It is to become like Jesus. That's the reason why He saved us. And He saved us so that we might be His witnesses in this world, that we might live for His glory in every choice that we make, and that we might share His gospel with others. And we need to be reminded from the Scriptures that, you know, even if there is this stigma attached to Christianity, and even if the enemy can bring all the skeletons that were out of the closet, which are not actually skeletons, but that's the way that the world would interpret it, that it's worth it to suffer, to identify with Christ and to suffer for Him, rather than to avoid that by denying Him. Paul suffered quite a bit in the social and political environment in which he ministered from the Jews and from the Romans, as, as we've already seen. He and Silas were beaten with rods and thrown into the prison. But again, he will later look back at his life and you know, look at the scars on his body and count them and say, hey, this was a privilege to do this because these blows were meant for Jesus. I did this to give glory to Him, and it did give glory to Him. Well, then, understanding what the right way is, we need to use what the Lord has given to us in order to be able to do what He's called us to do 
in order to resist the evil one. And we just read about that in Ephesians chapter 6. We need to put on the armor of God. You know, we need to, again, get into His Word. We need to be in prayer. We need to be in worship. We, we do need to have this assurance that we belong to Him. We need the encouragement that comes from fellowship with the people of God who earnestly desire to serve Him. And we need these things to protect ourselves. We need these things to grow until we become effective Christians who live for God's glory. You know, we need to understand how the enemy works. We need to see him when he's coming. And we need to know how to resist him. And we need the strength that God gives to us through the means of grace. There's really no substitute for that. It's, you know, just like an athlete trains in order to do well in his competition, just like soldiers are trained to be able to fight well, we need to be trained. We need to discipline ourselves to get into the Word, to get into prayer, and again, to make choices that honor the Lord and not choices that the enemy wants us to make so that we go further away from the Lord. We need to remember that we are involved in spiritual warfare. Well, let's stop here, and then we'll look next time at how the Lord has a purpose for everything. Uh, even when Paul and Silas do what's right and they suffer for it, God has a plan to glorify himself in the salvation of those inside the prison. Well, let's, let's bow in a moment of prayer.